Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joe Swimmer. I'm the Executive Director of the Episcopal Parish Network, and we are thrilled that you can be with us today to hear about some innovative ministry that's going on in the Diocese of Oklahoma and the work of the Episcopal Church Building Fund. And um, it's great to have our panelists with us today. And as a son of the Diocese of Oklahoma, I am very pleased to have um, the Bishop and Tim representing today. It's um, terrific to have you, Paulson and Tim, thank you. Um, but um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Anne. As soon as I mention um, that we would love to see all of you in Houston, March 6th through 9th next year for our 39th annual conference. Um, you can find more information about it on our website, which you'll find info on in the chat in just a second. And now, Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Fleming. I am the Vice President for Development and Operations with the Episcopal Church Building Fund, or as we like to call ourselves, the ECBF. Um, I want to allow all of our participants on the panel to introduce themselves. We've asked them to say their name, their role, and why they said yes to being with us today. Bishop Polson. So my name is Polson Reed. I'm the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Oklahoma. I've been in this role for about three and a half years now. And uh, I said yes to, to this because uh, I'm really hopeful about the future of our church. And I love when we get a chance to tell hopeful and forward-looking stories and, and to hear um, hopeful and forward-looking stories like these ones from Oklahoma and South Carolina. Uh, Tim. All right, I'm Tim Barron. I am a vicar at Grace Church in Yukon, Oklahoma, and I'm also chair of the board of Magdalene House, Oklahoma City. Uh, and I am um, I said yes to participating in this because I think the Episcopal Church has lots of good news to offer the world. And I believe uh, in starting new things, uh, new congregations, new ministries, trying new things, um, and stretching, stretching, um, pushing the limits uh, to see see what we can, how we can partner with uh, the kingdom of God. Um, Andrea, thanks, Tim. I'm Andrea McKellar. I'm canon for finance and administration um, for the Diocese of South Carolina. And conversations about uh, creative ways to do ministry is one of the favorite, my favorite parts of my job. So Bishop Reed. Thank you, Ken McKellar. I'm Ruth Woodliff Stanley, and I serve as a bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina. I said yes first, because when Ann Fleming asked me to do something, I say yes. <laughs> uh, and I also said yes, because uh, South Carolina has come through challenges in a way that is uh, leading us toward the future with a particular uh, fierceness and joy. And I'm excited to get to talk about that. Thanks. Thanks. So just to give everyone an idea of how we're going to do this, uh, we're going to ask Bishop Polson to start us off, kind of give us some grounding, and then Tim's going to talk a little bit more about the projects in South Carolina, or in, in Oklahoma. He could talk about South Carolina, but I think we'd, we'd be best off letting Ruth and Andrew do that part. So uh, off we go. Very good. Um, so as I think about... Um, all of this from the diocesan perspective. Um, we have been involved with two particular projects and they both involved uh, Tim Baer in a significant leadership role. Um, and these two projects have, have happened um, with not only a diocesan piece, but also really a significant investment from the building fund. Um, so it's really been a kind of multi-layer, uh, multi-point uh, partnership. And Tim Baer will give some details about uh, both of these projects in Oklahoma uh, in a little bit more detail in just a minute. Um, the first of these projects in Oklahoma uh, is a church plant, um, Grace Church in Yukon, which is a rapidly growing area uh, in Oklahoma, just outside the Oklahoma City metro area. Um, and then the second project um, is Magdalene House OKC, and this is part of the very familiar Magdalen House Network that Becca Stevens uh, launched uh, so beautifully that just continues to do incredible work uh, all around the country. Um, with both of these projects, Grace Church Yukon as a church plant, Magdalen House OKC as a new ministry, um, the role of the diocese really was as catalyst. 
Um, but we were not a catalyst in exactly the same way in these two uh, situations. So with Grace Church Yukon, um, with significant funding from the building fund, the diocese was also a, a significant funder. And this was a church plant um, over uh, a couple of bishops, myself and, and my predecessor in Oklahoma. Um, it's been a project that's involved very gifted clergy leadership um, by, uh, by Tim. And part of what I love about the story of Grace Church Yukon is that this was a church plant that happened um, in the middle of COVID. And despite all the challenges of COVID, this happened. And um, so during COVID, we uh, blessed the land and we built the building and we consecrated the building. Uh, and the congregation is off to a fantastic start in this uh, new building and is moving uh, ever steadier towards self-sufficiency and, and eventually parish status. Magdalene House, on the other hand, uh, is a, a ministry uh, that is a little bit different, but also very important. Oklahoma is a state with uh, one of the highest levels of incarceration in the country. Uh, Magdalene House is not specifically a diocesan ministry, but we did at the diocesan level help to raise seed money um, through an annual effort we have called the Bishop's Appeal, and we also helped in that appeal to raise some awareness about Magdalene House OKC, um, but there have been a number of different partners involved, uh, including the diocese and the building fund in getting Magdalene House off the ground. Um, for me, three uh, quick lessons about the diocesan role with these two uh, projects in partnership with others. Uh, for me, the first lesson has been the importance of going big sometimes in strategic situations. I worry sometimes in the life of our Episcopal Church that we've gotten a little timid, a little shy. Um, and so I think it's really good to go big uh, when the situation is right and we feel called by God to do that. Um, and I think we've certainly done that in these situations. Um, for me, the second lesson in all of this in the diocesan role is that there is a different role for the diocese in different situations, depending on the circumstance, uh, the strategy that's needed. So with Magdalene House and with Yukon, the diocese was involved, um, but in different ways. And third and last, uh, none of this happens without great leadership. Uh, we've had wonderful clergy and lay leadership in, in both these cases with both these projects and without those wonderful leaders, uh, it would not have been possible. Um, so wonderful stories both, and Tim's gonna tell you a little bit more about them. Tim. All right, thank you, Bishop. Um, yeah, so uh, in 2013, uh, my wife, who's also a priest, we were called to kind of come to come as a package together uh, to plant Grace Church in, in Yukon. And there was this kind of small struggling Episcopal church in that community uh, that um, had about 20 people on a Sunday. And uh, we actually ended up kind of closing that church down. We called it um, a sabbatical period and um, took an opportunity to let those that were to get for us to get to know those folks from the old congregation and uh, to invite whoever wanted to come help us start a new congregation. But um, we made it really clear that we were going to be um, kind of casting a new vision for that area. And really, if you when we asked them, they were dying for a new vision. Um, they really didn't know what they had to offer the community. Um, the two school districts that are in our area within a 15 minute drive, there's um, at that time, there are about 100 and 25,000 people. Now there's about, well, I think there are about 140. Now there's about 180,000 people uh, in, in that area. So we, it was a gr the fastest growing suburb uh, in, in the state of Oklahoma. And so it was a prime location for a much larger Episcopal church really, but um, we had to kind of cast the vision for that. And so uh, we launched that church in 2014. And our goal was to reach a lot of younger adults in their twenties and thirties. Uh, we were in our, our, we were in our late twenties at the time, uh, now late thirties near my wife is almost 40, uh, coming up, uh, in a, a couple of weeks. Um, but so we were kind of in that demographic that we were trying to reach. Um, our kind of mission field was to, to reach a lot of former evangelicals. That's kind of the, a big portion of the folks not going to church in Oklahoma are folks that grew up evangelical or charismatic and have dropped out for a variety of reasons. Um, a piece of that was uh, we were going to be an LGBT uh, affirming church and reach a lot of 
uh, LGBTQ folks and allies um, in that area. And that's something that we've been able to successfully do. Um, and over the years, we, we really grew really rapidly in those first few years. And um, eventually, uh, by 2017, 18, it was really clear that 150 on a Sunday was all we were going to get in that building. And so we started making plans to uh, plan and construct and a new building and raise money for that and what, what that would look like over the next couple of years. Um, it was kind of a, a chicken and egg issue, really, uh, that for us to get to 300 on a Sunday, which is what we saw and still see as possible, we needed more space. Um, Kevin Martin, who used to serve in the Diocese of Texas and then was dean in the cathedral in Dallas, uh, he was an early early coach for us. And, and he wrote a book called um, Breaking the 200 Barrier. And one of the things that he says about transitional sized churches is that, unfortunately, <laughs> they need more staff, more space, more people, and more money all at the same time. And that was definitely the case for us. Um, the diocese has kind of helped to continue uh, the, some to continue financial support for us uh, to help with the staff uh, piece. Uh, and we, but we needed more space uh, in order to kind of get to that sustainable budget level and people resource level to support that larger church. Uh, and so when it came time, uh, we raised a lot of money internally uh, in 2019 and in kind of a silent phase. And in, on March 1st of 2020, we launched our capital campaign, as Bishop Paulson said, the public phase. So it was not ideal timing, but we already had $600,000 in the bank that was given. And so we really knew, look, we've, we've already raised some significant money. We can't grow. So it's either a question of shrinking our dream and our, our vision and our horizon for this ministry or really trusting that where God had led us thus far was going to continue. And so taking that leap of faith during the pandemic was definitely a leap. Um, but that summer, uh, we decided to move forward with the capital campaign. We did the full in gathering in October of 2020, uh, masks and all. Um, and then, um, uh, as Bishop said, in 2021, we broke ground. So um, in order to make that happen, though, we we needed some more financing. Um and so in order to fill that, we did look at some, some local banks and traditional banks, but I had met, uh, met some of the board members from ECBF a number of years ago at a conference, and we knew that they might be someone who could offer us a little bit more favorable and flexible terms because they are connected with our denomination. They are mission-oriented and, and mission-focused. Uh, and so we were really pleased that we were able to get some really favorable terms. So, uh, and I can share what some of those are, right? You know, give a yeah. little plug. Okay. So uh, no, for example, rates have changed. <laughs> rates have changed. I won't share the rate. <laughs> um, I'm a little scared of what it'll be actually. But uh, the, the one of the things that we needed is a time horizon, right? To, for us to grow into our new facility. And so we asked if they could do three years interest only before starting the principal payments. Um, and they said, yes, uh, they, we locked in the rate for five years, which as I said, in a couple more years, we'll, we'll be hopefully come down from where it's at right now. Uh, and we amateurized that over, over 25 years. And then the other thing that ECBF was willing to do that a traditional bank would probably not be able, willing to do um, we asked if they they could work with us, like because we plan on doing several debt reduction campaigns over the next decade. And as we do that, can we reset uh, the payment to take into consideration um, the lower the lower principal amount? Uh, so it's not changing whatever the interest rate might be, but it does change the calculation of what that payment is uh, to make that a little bit easier for us. Uh, and so they said yes. Um, so we already uh, have made, we just made um, one $100,000 pay down uh, this month. And so that saves us, you know, uh, several thousand dollars in interest over the next, uh, over the next year. Um, so anyway, those were the, those were the types of things that really helped us with that. Uh, today, we're one year, we're just over a year in our new building. Um, our giving is up about 20% um, over 2022 numbers. Our attendance is up 15 or 16%. Uh, and so we're making that headway. Um, there's still a long way for us to go to reach all of our goals. Um, but this year by year, we are kind of sl sl slow and steady wins the race towards where we want to be. Um, so 
today we've got about 180 or so in attendance on Sunday in person. And again, like our our, our vision is is to towards 300. Um, and so anyway, that you know was was that's the our, our Grace Church our Grace Church project and kind of where we've been with that. And I, I Magdalene House was one of the things that that Anne really wanted to talk about. And I said, if I'm going to talk about Magdalene, I have to talk about Grace because the two go together for me um, in in many ways. One, it's it's the um, it's the people and the excitement and um, that desire to do love spreading, difference making ministry in the community that comes out of our energy at Grace Church that inspired some of us to come together and uh, begin discerning uh, the Magdalene House in Oklahoma City. So uh, Becca Stevens had come to Oklahoma a couple years ago and gave one of her presentations at our cathedral and um, several lay and clergy leaders uh, from the Oklahoma City Metro and some community nonprofit leaders. We all kind of gathered together afterwards and, and started, started really thinking about what it might look like to have a Magdalene house here in Oklahoma City. Um, some of the Magdalene houses deal uh, a lot with women coming out of prostitution. Others are really focused. Uh, and, and so some of those are taking women just off the streets. Um, others uh, work more closely with prisons and focus on women's incarceration issues. All of them deal with trauma and uh, trauma-informed care and uh, just to help women to lay a new foundation for their life and get all the wraparound services and resources that they really need to get a good shot at life and a new life after uh, after prison. And so um, we got, uh, you know, we built out built out a board, we we found a house and in order for us to buy the house, uh, which we closed on in um, de last December, so about 11 months ago, uh, we needed to figure out the financing. And we we went around in circles about several different options. And uh, I think I was at, I think I was at clergy conference or Dyson convention and Bishop Polson was asking how it was going. Um, because over that year previous, we, we, you know, we had been fundraising and organizing. So we'd gotten a hundred thousand dollar grant from a local foundation. We had a, a hundred, over a hundred thousand, just over a hundred thousand raised from that Bishop's appeal. And, um, and, and we'd continue to do some fundraising, but to get the house, what was that going to take? And Bishop Polson said, well, have you talked to ECBF? And I said, well, no, um, I haven't. Uh, and the, one of the reasons I hadn't was, though there are a lot of Episcopal organizations um, and churches and the diocese helping seed this, most of the Magdalene houses aren't officially uh, like diocesan or even even connected to a parish totally directly. And that's because you can open up lots of different funding sources if you're not. Um, and so, um, uh, but nonetheless, we did have, you know, the diocese, uh, we had the support of multiple congregations for this project. And so what we, what we pitched uh, to ECBF was, um, well, we said, can you help with this? And Anne said, maybe. <laughs> um, she loved loved the idea. I think you went to the board and talked to some folks and we met over the phone. And I said, well, look, we have five local churches that have pledged $30,000 uh, over a year, over the next three years, which will pay for the mortgage um, for the initial loan. And similarly, what we asked them was three-year interest-only loan so that then we could get this organization started, uh, get a track record of success, build up our donors, and then we would have that momentum to do a capital campaign and pay down the house and then refinance or pay it off altogether, God willing. Uh, and so they thought about it and they came back and said, you know, um, since you've got such broad support. It is an Episcopal endorsed ministry, even though it's a ministry, not a ministry of an Episcopal church or of the diocese explicitly. You've got these commitments from all these written commitments from all these churches. And so let's do it. And so we uh, purchased the home in December, the end of December 2022. Um, we were just we had an architect help us. Uh, the same architect from my church, actually, pro bono, uh, did the, the planning for the remodel of the house. Uh, we raised money for that a remodel and it's being completed in the next two weeks. Um, we hope to have women in the home in early December. Uh, so that's where we've been, we, where we've been with that, that project. Um, we're ex so excited for the, the momentum of that. Um, so my takeaways that I want to kind of share and leave with you, uh, like I, I firmly believe that justice work is important and crucial work for us. Uh, it is gospel work. Um, 
I'm also a priest and I'm really a pastor at heart. I'm a church planter. And I believe that the Episcopal Church has good news to a hurting world and that Christ has the ability to change lives. And I like Bishop Paulson, I think we need to go big sometimes and be bold with our message. Um, and, uh, because I think it takes healthy churches and healthy congregations in order to really inspire and seed and fund and take care of important justice ministries. Uh, it's not an either or, it's a both and for us as a church. Uh, and so um, I'm a big believer in redeveloping churches and starting new churches uh, in emphasizing congregational vitality. Um, I want to see us focusing on spiritual growth and spiritual growth that leads to numerical growth, um, because I think those are both important pieces of us living into our calling as the church. Uh, and as we grow and develop and plant healthy congregations, those congregations are going to be able to seed incredible ministries. So there's a little bit about my story. And so, Anne, I'll pass it back to you. Awesome. Um, I, I would like to say that um, while the initial answer was maybe, um, after that first phone call, um, our president, Bill Wiley, I remember he said, well, we don't have to treat this like a traditional mortgage. We can finance 100% of that if that gives you more money to put into fixing up the place. And I was like, yeah, that's how we do this. This is great. <laughs> yeah, he did indeed. Yeah, so that was like an extra mile on y'all's part. And we didn't even need to do 20% down which yeah. we have, but it left money to do other things. Right. Um, so, you know, all we need is, all we need is uh, the, the right pieces and that, that catalytic synergistic stuff can happen. Um, so Ruth, I'd like you to take, take it from here. Great. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Tim. That was inspiring to hear you all talk about what's happening in Oklahoma. And uh, you teed up nicely a starting place for us uh, which are the gospel values of inclusion and justice. And uh, that's really where our story begins. I want to I want to talk about the story of our diocese. Uh, and I believe that there are some things that might be applicable beyond the particular journey that we've been on. So um, we may be called the poster children of necessity is the mother of invention. And in our case, that necessity began with the necessity for our diocese uh, to stand for the gospel values of inclusion and justice and our uh, being fully serious about all means all. And so that led us into uh, a significant struggle, which has taken over a decade. Uh, in which I am grateful to say we are just very close to rounding uh, the corner to being complete with. And um, so we have some field notes from uh, the, the season that we are beginning post-schism. Um, but that's really important to name that that's where the story begins because we're really in the business of uh, recapitalizing a diocese. And we... Uh, are at once an historic diocese. And in some respects, uh, we're having to think like a startup. So uh, I wanna talk about the ways that we've been thinking um, and kind of back into, uh, which is really what we've done, back into what's been the plan. Um, so, so the first thing I would say is that in this season, I've been serving um, for two years. Uh, and since I've been on board, um, we've been in a season where we've had the decision of the state Supreme Courts uh, come to some finality and yet leave us a lot of gray area that we've had to um, negotiate. And uh, we could either have found ourselves back in court over a whole range of matters or we could have um, done what we've chosen to do, which is self-guided mediation with the ACNA folks. And the reason uh, that's important, I think, is because we've learned through that that um, it's been a means of helping us to clear out some obstacles so that uh, we could, to, could make the pivot and begin to really focus on the vision God has for us for the future. So that's been the first piece of work. And then 
Along with that um, came our awareness that we really needed to understand our recent story sitting inside a much larger story, something I think is true for us across the Episcopal Church. In our case, that meant looking at the recent uh, events of schism and understanding that there were others uh, long before this recent schism who uh, experienced a lot of the same impact of the schism uh, that, and I'm talking about our historically disenfranchised churches, primarily uh, our African our African American churches. Um, so we recognize that anything we were going to do to recapitalize the diocese needed to take into account that story. We also recognize that uh, in addition to uh, the fact that we needed to support our returning parishes, those that returned to the Episcopal Church and uh, and really set them up for a, a bright new season of sharing the gospel in the places where they're planted. We also need to support those that did not get property back, but where we know we are called to have an Episcopal presence and where we know the need is great for our particular message and our particular way of engaging the gospel of Jesus. So we ended up articulating three tiers of catalytic investment for the diocese. Uh, those places where we did get property back and where we needed to support Strong Start, as I said, those places that uh, did not get property back, but where we knew we needed to plant along with, um, and that includes places where we have seed congregations and places where we really don't have a seed presently, but we know we need a presence. And then the third tier, those who have been uh, historically disenfranchised, our African American congregations. So we really created a second budget, and that budget was designed to use some of the financial assets that came back uh, to support those three tiers. Um, so I want to just give you some examples in each of those tiers. In the first tier, I would I would point to uh, Christchurch Mount Pleasant, uh, where it, one of our faster growing uh, counties in our diocese, and we got back a, a large historic uh, property with a lot of acreage in a great location, and we really recognized that as we talked to community members there, both current Episcopalians, some who wanted to uh, come back to us from the Acne Diocese, as well as um, new families who were searching, that what the hunger is there is for a strong, vibrant Episcopal parish that has the ministries that you would expect, um, that has a strong youth ministry, that has strong outreach ministry, that has excellent preaching and music uh, that's connected in uh, meaningful ways to the community. So we really have been supporting that congregation with strong leadership, um, both lay and, and clergy leadership, outstanding clergy leadership to move forward. And uh, they are they are growing, um, I would say, week over week. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, and we set up with all of our returning congregations a, a financial model that allows them to have uh, benchmarks that they seek to reach by uh, every six months and so that our support can decrease as their capacity increases, which again, I think is a great model uh, for any uh, church start or restart. In the second tier, um, the work has been um, more about looking at uh, both metrics internal uh, to the church as well as uh, external in the community to understand who's in front of us, what the present needs are, um, what, as uh, one of my friends says, what has our name on it? Uh, so where is the call for us to be engaged in local community? So we really needed to do some discernment work, and we turned to our friends at ECBF, and Ann has um, been generous to come in and do some visioning and consulting work with the congregation. They did an early feasibility study to talk through um, what it would look like for that small but mighty congregation to help seed a parish, so to partner with us in that region to seed a new expression of the Episcopal Church. We've also recognized the need for some property expertise, and so we've um, had the gift of 
uh, a principal of a, a local real estate company that specializes in a property in that region to come in and vet uh, to, to narrow a list from about a dozen properties and vet property with us. And the concept that we have is, is really for them to be looking at property where they can have alternative uh, alternate revenue streams with uh, strong community partners so that their mission and vision intersects with the pra practical need uh, to make this work financially. So that work has been happening in parallel. And again, that's really for us about um, helping them to bring the, the aspirations that they have together with the practical realities. And that is in the fastest growing county of our uh, diocese. And so that work we're really excited about. And we think that all of the pre-work they're doing is gonna put us in a strong position to have success with that as a church plant with a, with a strong uh, seed congregation. The example I would point to in the third tier uh, is, is a fantastic, one of our fantastic historic churches, um, historic African-American churches, Calvary uh, in downtown Charleston that has, um, has really um, been a key leader, not only in the faith community, but in the city of Charleston and in the state and raising up uh, leaders in really every discipline and has had in past era a school uh, that has uh, formed young children and been a place uh, that has raised up uh, folks who have um, continued to have strong ties there. Uh, it's a congregation that was on the redevelopment cycle, really poised for redevelopment and need, needed certain ingredients. And we recognize that uh, part of the obstacle that they face was uh, historic discrimination, not only in the community, but from within the diocese. And so as part of repairing that breach, we elected not only to make a catalytic financial investment, but also um, we just started looking, we, we were realizing we needed to expand our diocesan office space as our, uh, our, as our team grew. And suddenly, you know, we just said, why would we um, be looking at space in high rent district in downtown Charleston when they have the space that used to be used for that school that's just lying empty every week. So we put a satellite office there. Uh, we agreed upon a market value uh, rent and improving that space so that we're, um, you know, we're good tenants. And when we leave, we leave it improved. Um, and that together with the catalytic investment changed the bottom line for them enough so that they were able to call uh, a fantastic new uh, rector. And uh, that rector, along with the lay leaders there, is articulating a plan uh, for redevelopment uh, for that historic parish, which we think will uh, put them in good stead to, to have a strong next half a century. So we're really excited about that because we recognize that they have been and need to continue to be um, a key parish in our diocese. So um, that's just some that's some example of the way we're working with the three tiers and how we're making those um, investments. We're, we are, as I mentioned before, we're in a process with we've got a, a, a financial team that Andrea uh, convenes and leads that works very closely with each of the tiers to look at their benchmarks and make sure that we're giving them the support they need so that they get to uh, the financial in independence that uh, that they want and so that they are seeing the growth um, that they expect to see. Um, we when when we, you know when we're running into problems with that, then you know we make some adjustments and we might slow a growth plan a little bit if we see, hey, this isn't quite as fast as we thought it was going to be, but it's still um, coming along. Um, but the primary thing is we're making upfront investments to make sure uh, that we don't just say, you know, good luck. We hope you do well. All of that for us is in uh, service of our understanding, again, that um, the, the struggle we went through that this diocese went through was for a reason, and we have a responsibility. We understand our responsibility to the gospel to include having strong, vibrant communities in every uh, in every corner of the diocese. Um, so I, 
I want to just come back and highlight, and I think Andrew's put them in the chat, but um, these are kind of the lessons from the field that we've taken. Um, you know, clearing out obstacles, seeing where you're where you're spinning wheels with diminishing returns on um, things with a very uncertain outcome. So in our case, those would be some of the remaining issues that we felt we could, you know, we could continue to fight all day long for years to come, but we weren't confident that we would prevail. And furthermore, um, we felt we needed to be directing that energy in a different way. Um, in some cases, you know, we're, we find that we're able to do that. And in other cases, we have to stay engaged in some of those hard discussions um, because we want to make sure that we are not negotiating things a way that we, we shouldn't. But at the same time, uh, in places where we say, yeah, we're, we, we think that's a reasonable trade-off to make. Those are the places where uh, we can remove some obstacles. And then connecting dots, always looking uh, for uh, how does this story, this present story, sit inside the larger picture? Um, gathering resources, I've mentioned e ECBF, I've mentioned the real estate group that we have been working with, um, the, the other folks who've been working with us in both financial modeling as well as church planting uh, wisdom. And then relying on uh, data, you know, we've got great resources we're using there, both internal data and community profile kind of demographics and data. Assessing with some kind of regular schedule, adjusting, and then finally um, telling the story. That's what this is about. Uh, we're trying to do that every time we get a chance. Andrea, what have I left out or um, might need to be corrected? Yeah, I think the one of the things um, that we found that's been really encouraging is while the money obviously helps, there actually hasn't been as much need for funding as we originally expected. The big thing has been that we're working as a team, that we're able to give be there as cheerleaders, as resources, um, I think has been a big help. And all that excitement, same as it sounds like they're seeing in Oklahoma, is that people are seeing the vision, they're seeing the dream, and funding is coming in higher and more than we expected and on the plate in many of the churches as well, which is just so inspiring to see that everyone is getting excited about it. Yeah. One example that... Um, Bishop Ruth didn't mention was St. James, that they're a church that came back with a very large campus um, that didn't need all of that space. So one way we're re-envisioning, it's, an, it's, an, um, it's right in Charleston, which is a huge wedding venue. Um, and we were uh, renovating the space to be able to use it as for weddings. It overlooks uh, the graveyard, but it has these beautiful oak trees with Spanish moss, great lighting, um, good parking, things that you don't find in Charleston. Um, and uh, so we're really excited about the future there. Like, how can we see some alternative revenue streams here as well to really support that congregation long term? And then hopefully they can grow into that space as well in the future. One other thing I want to mention, thanks for remembering St. James, is uh, in addition, for those of you who have camp and conference centers, uh, I just want to put a plug in for ECCC because we've been running a parallel process at, Episco at St. Christopher Camp and Conference Center, which was returned to us. And our friends at, at ECCC have been extraordinarily supportive in doing very similar work. So we've brought in ECCC consultants, ECCC interim executive directors, prior to our, naming our executive director. And they really came in and helped us do uh, a lot of the similar work to review uh, the, the financial picture, to review our use of property, um, to uh, do some good HR review. So um, that's another place where we've, we've had a similar roadmap. Yeah, and we've been able to do so much new creation care ministry there um, that one of the programs they have, the Barrier Island Nature Program, brings almost every fifth grader in the state to come do a nature program for a, a couple nights. Um, and it's something all the fifth graders look forward to. Unfortunately, my son was in fifth grade during COVID, so we haven't gotten to experience it. Um, but it it keeps the camp side full all throughout the year. So it, it's been um, really great to see that uh, we're connecting with people all over that way. So um, does anyone um, want to comment on when we're looking at buildings, whether we're building new ones or um, trying to redevelop old ones, you, a couple of you have talked about the importance of having healthy congregations and strong leadership. What do you do with a, a place that seems to maybe have lost its way a little bit around its identity 
and isn't right sized for its property? What are you seeing that encourages you um, and might be able to help people apply what you've learned to their local context? Well, I can jump in on just a, a little bit of that. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about uh, often um, in, in the office here at the diocese is just that with these these buildings that we have, of course, they can be a, an asset, they can be a, a, a challenge and an expense, but that if we sell them, we never get them back. Um, and so oftentimes we are in communities have been in communities for a very long time. And the initial um, sense may be, oh, you know, perhaps uh, that this is a congregation to be closed and a building to be sold. And we've really tried to resist that. Um, and instead to say, where are there opportunities for, for reinvention? Where are those community partnerships available? We have uh, a wonderful canon to the ordinary here in Oklahoma who loves nothing more than to just go into a community and meet people and have uh, fantastic Holy Spirit-led conversations with folks in the community uh, that often leads to, to a fresh perspective when it comes to, uh, to the building. Um, and uh, we too are having the conversations as well about you know, sharing spaces in creative ways, sharing spaces with other churches, uh, with other nonprofits, and, and uh, in some cases that's, a, that's an answer. Um, Ruth, I think you were going to jump in. Yeah, no, I, I think amen to everything that you, you just said. Um, you know, I, I, I really agree with that about, you know, once a place is gone, it's gone. And and I would say in our case, and, and as we've done this, the negotiations post-SISM, we've been very careful about that. Um, we we had only two where we made a different decision, and those were only after much um, discernment, I would say, and, and, and clear review of, um, what our capacity was and how it would impact, uh, the wider community as well as other churches in, um, in the geographic range where, where we made those, uh, tough decisions. But generally, I agree with what you just said, Paulson, and I think, um, this, it really kind of relates to a question I see in the chat. So if I can presume, and I'm going to jump in and talk about alternative revenue streams, because um, this is something dear to my heart too. And I think it is something that, um, you know, that really does allow us to um, think in new ways about our buildings as, as you all are saying and living in Oklahoma as uh, not just for us in the old conventional ways, but as really community centers. And so, you know, looking at um, where is there, you know, where's there a symphony that needs to have housing? Where is there an LGBTQ plus youth entity that needs our support that might be able to be housed? That's um, where there could be a win-win, where there's an, yes, there's a revenue stream, but it also um, helps that entity and lets us partner in common mission. So um, I think that is, you know, that's a way um, to, to do this. I think also we need to think less congregationally and more, um, you know, I, I agree with this concept of more as a diocese and frankly, as a wider church about how we share resources. Uh, this is, there's some justice issues uh, embedded here because some of the places that most struggle are also places that have been disenfranchised due to systemic and structural uh, racism. Um, and classism. And so being able to look at how we share resources and uh, at a diocesan level and at a church-wide level uh, to make sure we're keeping a presence in communities um, where we so vitally need to be there, but where, um, you know, due to some of those um, types of of frankly oppression, uh, it's created an undue burden for the individual congregation. So pooling resources, and again, back to kind of, for us, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, we kind of stumbled into that answer because we had to work that way in recapitalizing a diocese. I mean, you don't reopen the doors of some of these historic, uh, gorgeous parishes with, you know, 20 faithful souls and just say good luck. You know, you have to support them in that way. Um, we have a question here, Ruth, um, about 
how the um, how ECBF funding was involved with the work in South Carolina. Um, I could answer that, but I think you should answer it. You picked up the phone. So um, I would say stay tuned um, because I think the best is yet to come in terms of the ECBF South Carolina partnership. But uh, we already have some loans on the books with uh, ECBF, um, it, some loans that uh, ECBF was uh, generous to make during uh, during really a difficult time in this diocese to some of our displaced congregations. I'm thinking about um, St. Anne's Conway, and I think we've got a couple of loans on the books like that. But now um, we are in conversation with ECBF about uh, our intent to come knocking on the door for loans in several areas in, I would say, um, certainly the first tier and the second tier of those uh, catalytic investment tiers I named. And, and we're doing the pre-work. And, 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 and I mean, I think Anne's coming to town and uh, we, we filled up her dance card. So the pre-work includes this kind of review of the uh, demographics, internal, external, and the congregational vision. So that when we come to ECBF with a request, we've done some vetting. And, and then we're doing the property vetting where property is concerned ahead of asking, making the ask. And, and for for a lot of the work that that I've been doing, it's it's really about helping the congregation get clear about what do they need and what can they afford. Um, and, and sometimes people get busy, you know, designing, you know, stained glass before they have really figured out what do they need need, um, and how does it align with what the community needs, and how we can be the hand and feet of Christ in our communities, and how do we open those doors instead of, uh, and trying to be creative. I, I agree with something you said, Polson, earlier about, I think we tend to think too small, um, and we think we have to fix it, um, and we do have to be smart and steward our resources appropriately, and we also have to have faith in where the spirit is leading us. Um, Tim, did you see this question in the chat? It, it says, how did you attract the younger folks and former evangelicals? Um, that's, a, I, that's a long question really to answer in a really good way. Uh, but in a short way, I can say that one of the things that we did was we built our team and our leadership and our staff uh, to really reflect the kinds of people that we wanted to, um, that we wanted to help find a home within our, our congregation. Uh, so even from the very early days, um, from a, as a launch team, we, we went out and found, um, found younger people to, um, to help us start the church. And then, uh, as well as LGBTQ folks, and, um, we've lifted them up all along the way. So if you look at our website and look at our staff and leadership page, uh, you'll see that the average age still today uh, of our bishops committee is probably right around 40. Uh, I think we have two people over 50 on it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can, um, if you like, I can jump in on the resource development office question. Is that okay? Yes, please. Yeah. So we um, in Oklahoma, we do not have any sort of staff member dedicated to uh, financial resource uh, development within our diocesan office. We have had positions like that at various points in the past, uh, but don't have that currently. Uh, but what we have done is we have prioritized um, in, in Oklahoma uh, having just a little bit of money every year that now is directed towards a fund that is for church planting, for church redevelopment, for that type of, of more expensive um, and important creative work. Um, because what we don't want to do is uh, have a, a beautiful idea that comes uh, from the Holy Spirit, and then we're not able to have the resources to do it. And, and we recognize that it's really important for us to be able to have places uh, like church plants, like Tim's been involved with, new ministries that are happening, really significant redevelopment of churches. Congregational vitality is the, the absolute heart of uh, what we're about um, in this particular phase of our life together. And so just having a little bit of money every year that goes into this fund that we can use as it grows larger for those planting and redevelopment and other creative efforts. So, has been huge for us. So we have been able to raise some money when we've needed to do that, uh, but knowing that that we are 
uh, seeding that fund um, continually has also been helpful. We've had something a little bit similar in South Carolina too. Since 2014, we've had a ministry grant line that's outside of the budget. It comes straight from um, the trustees and it, it is really for dreaming. That's what we encourage people for new ministry, for things outside. It's not to pay an organist. It's not to fix the roof. Like what, what new cool thing. And, you know, one of our churches asked for a thousand dollars to start a flower ministry and they pick up flowers at a funeral home every week from the, and then distribute them to teachers in schools and to people in hospitals. And it was all they needed was money for a cart and some vases. And it's turned into this great big program. So it's something where a little bit can turn into something really big. So it's beautiful to see when that works. I I, I love that. And I would I love that we do it. And I would add we may steal from y'all Oklahoma this idea about fundraising specifically toward that fund. Um, that that's a great that's a great idea we we don't have a person uh, as andrea saying you know specifically doing it but i will say i will add to what she said and just say we we um have just done a really great grassroots process of um, working on a strategic vision and plan and i anticipate that the logical next step is, you know, okay, folks, now we've got some things we need to really fund in a in a new and more comprehensive way. So I think uh, we, we've got our eye on that and we are blessed to have some lay leaders in particular who have deep experience in development work. So um, I'm counting on their, uh, their generous gift of some volunteer hours and then we'll see where that um, leads us. Um, we have the beginning of a question, but I don't see the end of it. Um, so wh while we uh, see if that one gets retyped, I, I have to say that what we've found recently with the fund is the power of being able to leverage um, to, to take something that seems small but important and then find people to rally around. Uh, part of what we looked at with the Magdalene House was it, it was hugely important for us to have that written you know written notes from both the bishop and then the the clergy of the five congregations in Oklahoma City saying we are committed to this project um and it helped with the initial fundraising so that we already had data on um to evaluate so finding ways to say um yeah this this there's a there there um and sometimes we have to try things um, and, and maybe they aren't going to go exactly the way we thought. Um, but earlier this year, we closed a large solar project in the Diocese of Newark, um, where we put solar panels on 17 roofs, 14 churches and, and three rectories. It involved five utilities, um, different um, metering rates, depending on if it was residential or commercial. It was a complicated thing. Um, but before it was even done, we had churches who hadn't signed on to the original tranche saying, can we get solar panels on our churches? So it is one of those things where these things that you do um, make a difference. Um, I, I love working for the fund because I, I am convinced I, I took a little stint in the secular world between some, some church postings and, and realized the importance of having safe places to have conversations. Um, to to lift up the people who are marginalized and that's why i was so excited that um everyone on this panel today said yes because i think your stories are inspiring and can help um other people say well let's let's try it let's fail forward let's let's step out and trust knowing that if we fall flat on our face well you know i always say i'm five feet four inches closer to my goal <laughs> Um, okay, so the question is, how do you fund the diocese assessments to parishes or voluntary parish pledges? Um, sorry, I need to put my glasses on what I needed to. Well, I'm, I'm glad to share what we do with that at Oklahoma. So we, our mutual ministry support, as we call it in Oklahoma, um, it, it is a um, a requirement of, of a certain kind. I mean, there are, are particular things that come with fulfilling that um, or not. But our uh, what I would say is that our emphasis in Oklahoma has been on lowering that mutual ministry support percentage, that percentage of plate and pledge uh, 
uh, lower and lower all the time to keep more money in our congregations. So in Oklahoma, we've gone from a high of about 22% of, uh, of uh, mutual ministry support down to 15, um, and we hope to take it even lower um, in the future. Just that recognition that if we're going to be about congregational vitality, most of that vitality happens on the congregational level, and more money staying in congregations means uh, uh, more money for, for vitality and more resources for God's mission on the local level. So that, that's how we how we handle that. And we actually came from the other end, um, that historically, a lot of the churches that stayed in the diocese after the schism had not been supporting um, the diocese with more than one or two percent. So we've been working at getting our churches up to 10 percent. Um, most are in the six to eight percent range currently. Um, so we're working on it being kind of in that middle as well. All right. Well, I think we are coming to the natural end. We, I'm not seeing a lot of um, questions pertaining to the Catholic life of, uh, of your diocese. Um, of course, if anybody wants to follow up, uh, contact Joe. Um, the, this recording will be going out. Um, there's a, and, and the copy of the chat will go out to participants as well. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about the Episcopal Church Building Fund, you can check us out on our website. Um, I'm just to let you know, I'm the, I'm the face of the organization. So you're probably going to get me, um, at least on the, the first, the first blush. Um, but if you got a question or you got a project, please reach out. You know, we, we try not to start with no, we start with, well, that's interesting. Let's, let's hear more. All right, Joe, I think we're good. Thanks so much, everyone.